Well, thank you guys for braving the weather. Although by your standards, this is like nothing I know, but uh, you know, California made me a little soft, I think. So, um, thank you. Other side. There we go. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, you know, uh, as uh, indicated, I have done uh, spent a fair amount of time in classrooms. So, uh, I originally got my master's degree. I grew up in Montana. Grew up on a ranch in Montana. Uh, attended uh, Montana State University, which I like to think of as the Stanford of the Northern Rockies. Although, <laughs> I, I think I'm the only person. Uh, and then ended up uh, go, doing my uh, ended with master's degree there, doing uh, graduate work at the University of Washington, my PhD in statistics. Uh, and then I'll, I'll share this uh, in part because. When I had a master's degree in mathematics in Montana, it presented the problem of, well, what am I going to do to make a living with a master's degree in mathematics in Montana? So the path of least resistance was uh, teaching and coaching in a small uh, town, Lewistown, Montana, 8,000, 9,000 people. Uh, it was a big event after I left that they got their first McDonald's, so that gives you some sense of the community. Uh, went to the University of Washington, uh, found out we were pregnant with our first child as I passed my first year qualifiers. Uh, found out we were pregnant with our second child as I uh, passed my comprehensive exams after my third year, and I got very revenue motivated. And so uh, I was teaching one of those uh, lovely summer classes to, it was either engineering or business, I can't remember, uh, you know, where they've put off their stats class for as long as humanly possible. Uh, and they're very motivated to be, you know, at the, in one of the most beautiful places in the world, Seattle, in the summertime, because, you know, the rest of the nine months, it's kind of dreary, uh, in a stats class. So I'm not really looking forward to teaching, but uh, I have an uh, email early email system, but an email, forwarded from the secretary of the department, uh, Peter Gutorp, who was the uh, chair at the time, had received a, an email from uh, Boeing. And uh, uh, they were just starting the 777 build program. And the email went something like this. Uh, we're looking for somebody who's got statistical knowledge and platform skills uh, because we're starting uh, the 777 build. Uh, we are uh, implementing uh, TQM and we need to know somebody, we need somebody who knows SPC and DOE. I read through that first paragraph and barely understood a word of it. The second paragraph, though, led with, and we're paying you know, $50 an hour contract wages, and I immediately understood and was committed uh, to the endeavor. So I went home that night, you know, I picked up a, you know, hit the library on the way out, checked out a Deming, checked out a Duran, started reading this stuff, and thought, well, this is kind of obvious, isn't it? You know, this idea of putting quality uh, tools, pretty simple quality tools, in the hands of the people actually doing the work and having them monitor and improve their own quality, this, this must be kind of natural. Everybody must be doing this. And then I started working at Boeing and found out that very, very much to the contrary, this was a culture that was built on the opposite of that. It was, uh, here's, the, here's the rule. Here, they used to create bar charts. So we're smart industrial engineers who were figuring out what the average person could do in an average unit of time. They'd give everybody their bar chart. It was called working to the bar. Well, naturally, you know, rudimentary statistics means half the plant is sitting idle half the time if everybody's working to their bar. So you had all these, you know, it's just an incredibly dysfunctional uh, plant. But I just was fascinated by it all. It was like this big anthropological experiment. And so I got involved doing, because uh, it was Boeing, they had to build out their own quality system. So they had the AQC system. So I helped them develop that. And then started doing consulting, because all their suppliers had to follow the AQC system. And randomly, one of my clients ended up being Group Health Cooperative. So Group Health is you know, health partners, essentially. It used to be a Group Health, um, established by a bunch of socialist wobblies back in the late 40s who uh, mortgaged their houses, uh, loaned uh, money, threw in with some docs, bought a hospital, and said, we believe in uh, prepaid health care. And at the time I joined the organization, we were serving you know, 600,000. When I left, we were serving about 800,000 people in the state of Washington and Idaho. And, uh, but I just came as a consultant, and I was going to help them uh, start to implement some of these basic ideas. And uh, it turns out I fell in love with healthcare. And I fell in love with healthcare for multiple reasons. One is, uh, you know, there are, there are very few environments where there are more smart people per square meter than healthcare. 
right? There, it's just filled with people who are uh, incredibly bright. Um, it is also one of the most mission-oriented environments you could ever work in. People are self-select into healthcare for uh, uh, reasons that are admirable. Um, and you know, make you want to be there. So different than manufacturing. And nothing against Boeing. The planes are fine. You know, they're very safe because you have to be. Because the first thing announced when a, a plane goes down is who made it. It was a Boeing 737 that crashed. So you know, they achieve high levels of quality. They just do it in a very did at that time a very inefficient way. But you know, it doesn't have that sense of mission orientation that healthcare did. And then thirdly. Uh, the processes were so messed up that I could immediately add value, which was kind of fun, right? That you go into this place, I didn't know anything about healthcare, but I knew processes and I knew how to think about process. And so I was, you know, a value add to these really smart and mission oriented people. And, you know, I thought, well, I'll do this for a little bit. I'll get my dissertation done and then I'll go back being, you know, an uh, academician. Um, 20 years later, I'm still at Group Health, having had a variety of very cool jobs. Never having finished my dissertation, I'm still ABD. Uh, all my credits have expired at this time, so that, that train has definitely left the, the station. Um, but, uh, you know, it had the opportunity to work my way through a variety of really interesting problems. Then went to California. I was the chief operating officer at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation, uh, subsidiary of Sutter, so very large medical group practice. My motivation at the time was to uh, really understand the great unwashed fee-for-service system because group health was a little bit of a too special of a crucible, right? It was completely prepaid, totally capitated. We were doing, by the time we left, we had done a number of uh, interesting innovations. You know, it was a great place. Ed Wagner, uh, father of the chronic disease model, his office was two doors down from mine. I mean, I had some of the best uh, teachers ever in terms of understanding, you know, advanced ambulatory care. Um, but we did, you know, a number of interesting things in primary care, uh, built one of the first medical homes at scale uh, anywhere in the country, uh, showed that we saved about $50 million a year uh, in uh, recurring savings, um, at the same time reducing physician burnout, improving quality, uh, improving satisfaction. Uh, and uh, we came down, replicated that. And, you know, the, the nice thing about group health is you never had to have a conversation about, you know, how do you get compensated? So. The part, one of the results of that work was we saved, none of, uh, we, uh, by the time we were done, I, about three quarters of my clinics were doing more virtual business than they were doing physical visits, right? So more touches overall, but more virtual, more than 50% than physical. So, you know, had a nice opportunity to understand a lot of things, transformational things, got to apply that in the great unwashed fee-for-service environment at Palo Alto. Uh, it was a great experience. We did kind of similar primary care transformations, a uh, number of different, uh, you know, interesting things. Um, and I was just getting started at Palo Alto when uh, a friend of mine called, who happened to be the CEO at Stanford, uh, Amir Rubin. And if you don't know Amir, you probably won't fully appreciate this story, but if you've ever met Amir, you will. Um, Amir does not understand the word no. So Amir calls me. I'm coming back from one of these, you know, in, incredibly long and boring Sutter management meetings. Uh, I'm driving from Sacramento back down to uh, uh, the peninsula. And uh, Amir calls me and goes, you know, I'm recruiting for a chief operating officer. And it strikes me, you're the perfect guy. How about you take this job? And I thought, well, I'm flattered. That's nice, Samir. It's terrific. But I just, you know, I'm only 18 months in at PAMF, and you know, how can I? I can't make that move yet. And things are going really well. And flywheel's turning over. We're gaining momentum. I just can't. And I swear, over the next 10 days, the man was relentless, and he just wore me down. And you know, he wore me down in two ways. One was it's just Amir's personality. He just overwhelms. Um, but the second is he was selling a pretty interesting proposition because Stanford is a pretty interesting place. You know, you can't, if you've been there, you appreciate the, you know, it is truly the heartbeat of the Silicon Valley. Uh, so much of the innovation that happens in the Valley is a direct result of Stanford. And they really are intentional about creating that kind of environment with their undergraduates and graduates. And a lot of that spills over into the healthcare setting. And I had never been in an academic inpatient environment before. So hence the last, you know, four plus years, almost five, uh, we had a 477-bed academic hospital, the highest CMI in the country, uh, level one trauma center, double rooms. But in that environment, we had 
Um, 12 of my 18 nursing floors were 90th percentile of Press Ganey. We had some of the highest quality scores uh, in the West Coast. We uh, had the biggest VAD program uh, in the West Coast, and we had, <laughs> trust me, limited OR capacity. So it was an exercise in trying to figure out how do we do this in a different way. It was so bad that in a bad flu season, I'd have to put up a tent in the uh, parking lot of the ED. Now, you can only get away with that in California where it, this wouldn't, wouldn't work here, um, you know, for the vertical patients. So that you could, we just, we had 41 bays when I counted the hallway beds, right? So it was a real exercise in how do you work differently to achieve levels of excellence. And one of the things I always appreciated about Stanford was the bar was always set quite high. You know, we were, uh, became a top 20 hospital while I was there. The year I left, they became a top 10 hospital. But it, I was always amused, you know, when you talked about that, they'd kind of nod and pat you on the head and say, well, what's it going to take to be a one or two? Because that was the bar. And so it was a lovely environment. Now, what led me to come to uh, Minnesota was, uh, you know, I, you get recruited for these jobs, and most of the time it's easy to say no. And um, I initially said no to the Fairview job. And I actually had two offers or two jobs that this recruiter was asking me to pursue. One was a nice academic job, top, uh, top 10 university, which was kind of attractive. The other was Fairview. And so I looked at the top 10 job. It was attractive. And I started reading through the materials of Fairview. And what struck me was, as an organization, it has literally every asset that you'd want to have if you're going to build the care delivery system of the 21st century. From you know, an academic presence, a pediatric and adult academic presence, uh, community physicians, multiple hospitals, uh, a broad pluralistic physician environment, uh, a health plan, a senior care division, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It just had everything. And so I was intrigued enough to start the process. The more I talked to people, uh, the more intrigued I got. And so I moved to Minnesota uh, in December of last year, which for mo many of my friends at Stanford was a little bit of a head scratcher. So here I am. There's my, now you have at least enough to know whether you should hang out for the next half hour, 45 minutes, or you, if you get up and leave now, I won't be terribly offended. So a lot going on in healthcare, huh? I never thought that you know, I'd have to get up in the morning and read a Twitter feed to figure out he federal health care policy, but there it is, right? Um, you know, a lot of things happening. This is hardly even scratches the surface of what's going on, but it certainly creates a dynamic environment. Now, the way I simplify it for our folks at Fairview is, look, this whole thing comes down to a pretty simple conversation. This is a, a dialogue we're having at a... At a, a societal level about how much are we willing to subsidize the cost of health care for those at or below the FPL. That's what all of this is about. It has, really has very little to do with the ACA, it has very little to do with anything else, except how much are we willing to spend to support people and their access to health care who are at or near FPL. Original budget proposal uh, combined with the original ACA repeal was $1.5 trillion cut to Medicaid. That pretty much signaled you know, the policy direction, but now it's played out in a number of different ways, whether, you know, whether CHIP gets reauthorized, it will. You know, ACA repeal is now you know, embedded in a tax bill around the individual mandate. How big of impact that will have in the short term is probably not that great, but over the long term, it's hard to have insurance when you can cover yourself at the time that you are sick, which was the whole point of an individual mandate, right? Without that, you can't have guarantee issue. So, you know, people who don't understand some of the fundamentals of healthcare, monkeying around with healthcare often make a mess of it. I think that's a fair characterization of what we have is a little bit of a mess uh, at the federal policy level. And of course, all that rolls downhill to the state and uh, to the local organizations. Now, that's important to Fairview because uh, depending on how you measure it, we are the largest Medicaid provider in the state of Minnesota. John Pryor at Hennepin would say, oh, no, no, we are. And he's right if you only look at admissions and discharge. But if you look at totalized touch and total dollars spent on Medicaid, we are. Um, so all of these decisions about Medicaid uh, we're interested in because you could do what other organizations have done and say, well, you know what, uh, we just don't want to participate or we really cap our participation in Medicaid. But that's an important part of the communities we serve. And that's an important part of you know, who Fairview is, and the University of Minnesota is, as a land-grant uh, institution, 
we serve the communities that we're in. So we can't do what a, a I'll pick on Kaiser, what Kaiser's done, which is essentially say, you know, yeah, we'll advocate at the policy level, but we don't actually care for Medicaid patients. So what's else going on? Well, so I think a fascinating, we're at a fascinating time in the macroeconomics of, of healthcare. So I have my moments when I think back to you know, 30, 40 years ago and think how easy, much easier this job was. Right? If I were in this position 30, 40 years ago, we were in the cost plus days. All I had to do was add up the costs, add a number, 10%, 12%, 14% maybe, hand it to the payers, payers would take it, hand it to the employers, and it's all good. The job was essentially figure out where you spend it. The problem with that, and I still remember the Wall Street Journal article, right, the picture of a General Motors assembly plant, and the gist of the article on the front page of the Wall Street Journal was uh, the single biggest expense in this car are the health benefits of the employees who are assembling it. Right? And that was the moment in which uh, you started to see this huge shift of economics to consumers away from employers. The employer said, look, we can't afford this. This is the fastest growing expense line, sometimes our biggest expense line. We need to shed this risk. And who do they shed it to? People. You know, I remember when deductibles were introduced and it was all under the right guise of you can't have a consumer economy in healthcare unless you have skin in the game. Well, that's fine if it's $250, $500, but we're, the average, the, the uh, saw a data point yesterday, the average deductible, $4,900 for an individual. So we're past the dermal layer, we're now towards, uh, you know, muscle and bone. You know, average, the median income in the U.S. about $60,000. You start thinking about spending post-tax $60,000 and you're accounting for $5,000 plus premium you know, and you pay your rent or your mortgage, food's starting to look a little optional at this point, right? So it, we're at a point of inelasticity in terms of consumers' ability to continue to absorb our medical inflation. And in large part, that's why people haven't had a raise in 20 years. It's all been coming to us as a healthcare system. Well, so it's not like the government's gonna step up. It's not like employers are ready to start taking on inflation. It's not like consumers can do it continually, uh, and we're at kind of the tipping point of that. So, you know, you look around and say, well, who's left? It's pretty clear. It's care delivery systems. There's going to be incredible, and we're already starting to feel that, but I think it's just the start of that, starting to feel this incredibly downward pressure on our revenues. All right? We felt it this year at, at Fairview, but it's not like, oh, we're the only ones, you know, geez, if we were just better managed. Yes, we could do a better job of managing our organization. I'll talk about some of those things. But this is a national phenomenon, right? Moody's downgraded not-for-profit hospitals, their outlook, for the first time because of this phenomenon. They see what everybody else is seeing is, wow, care delivery systems are going to have to bear the risks and the continued medical inflation. So interesting times. We also, you know, this affordability index goes to my point earlier around, you know, what's the ratio of family health insurance premiums to median household income? You know, when you're hitting 30%, you're starting to talk about a pretty big bite out of the total. And it's having impacts, right? MD Anderson, 1,000 workforce reduction, Brigham and Women's, 1,600 voluntary buyouts, they have to address costs, Catholic Health Initiatives, 500, 161, Advocate, $200 million in cuts. These are just randomly selected out of, you could have, you know, 100 of these things. It's happening everywhere, where people are having to think about how do we lower our cost basis because of these downward revenue pressures. So it is the world we live in, it is not going away, you know, for at least, you know, the rest of my professional life, which is, I'm a relatively young guy, I'll keep telling myself until somebody believes me, um, you know, it's the world we live in. And what's really fascinating to me, and this was uh, courtesy of a, uh, a friend, a colleague at Stanford, uh, who was pointing out the uh, doubling rate of clinical knowledge. You think about this, if you went to med school, in 1950, and you were as smart as Dave, and learned everything there was to know about clinical care. And at that point in time, you could look and see how long is it going to take for that body of knowledge to double? 
That was 50 years. You wouldn't expect that body of knowledge to double until the year 2000. For a graduate in 2020, who let's assume is you know, a, a, an amazingly bright individual who's understood the entire body of clinical knowledge, it will double in 0.2 years. So the idea of how we're going to, you know, what does it mean to be a physician? How, does it, how do we deliver clinical care effectively uh, is immensely challenging. Right, because the level of knowledge that's represented as clinicians is unknowable in terms of the vast body of it. So how do we create systems? How do we create mechanisms to make sure the right information is the right place at the right time to be able to support patient care? So that's a pretty significant challenge. Now, with all these advancements, what's happening? Well, um, it, you know, it's, it's kind of amazing. Right? You think about a drug like Savaldi. Savaldi cures hep C. So even though it costs, you know, when it was introduced to the market, you know, $80,000 with a 98% cure rate, you could somehow rationalize that this was a good thing. But these biologics that were being introduced, or are being introduced, and we're just at the hockey stick of that introduction. If you look at the pipeline, we're going to see expansions over the next few years that are going to be breathtaking. And many of them are going to be truly breakthrough therapies. <clears throat> They're going to change the way we think about care. In 10 years, you know, the way that we think, if we looked at cancer care today, and we fast forward to 10 years and we look backwards, we'll look at this and think it's archaic. Because we'll be genotyping individuals and their tumors and mixing custom cocktails for their cancer in 10 years. That clearly was within reach, right? There's immunotherapies, all kinds of wonderful, that it's gonna be transformative. But here's the challenge. Well, one challenge is they're damn expensive, right? Uh, now it's not uncommon to see treatment therapies that are, you know, half a million, a million even. And often the efficacy of them are not as clear as a cure rate. They're measured in quality of life months saved. So it's going to create a very difficult uh, conversation societally in organizations about how do we manage that. And I love this, love this study, 2010, a two-arm study uh, looking at uh, small lung cancer. Uh, small cell lung cancer. Two arms. One got normative care. The other got normative care plus palliative care. Now, obviously, in the palliative care, people end up choosing more conservative treatments. That was kind of expected by the experimenters. But what wasn't expected was the people in the palliative care arm live longer. And this is our inherent challenge, because it isn't only about the science. Right? We're not simply you know, a bag of biology. So it is about the entirety of the experience and how we interact with a care system. So this presents pretty significant challenges. And then we've got the evolution of te technology, right? My kids are, well, they have birthdays coming up, so 26 and 28. I swear to God, everything they do is on a mobile phone, right? Where they're going to eat, what they're going to eat, who they're going to date, uh, how they interact with me. I mean, it all happens. It's all mediated by a mobile phone. And while it's important to be able to interact this way in today's world, it will be the decision about whether people choose you or not in the future world. And then on the provider side, it is completely ironic to me that, you know, I'm a fan of EMRs, and I was responsible for an epic implementation at Group Health. You know, I remember the paper chart days. I remember how hard it was to get that Pit that chart to the right place at the right time. And then, you know, some patients, chronic disease, complex, comorbidity, they'd have multiple volumes of thick charts. No doctor had the time, the capability to understand all the relevant data. Well, EMRs largely solved that problem. The challenge is, what's the interaction medium between us and this amazing technology? It's the QWERTY keyboard. The QWERTY keyboard was invented, it says 1890 there, it's actually 1860. Invented in 1860 to solve a very specific problem. So if you lay the keys out in alphabetical order, there are certain key combinations that happen a lot in terms of their adjacency, and the keys jam, those mechanical arms jam. S and T, great example. So some smart person, probably a statistician, <laughs> thank you for laughing at that, <laughs> figured out a different pattern to the keyboard to minimize the probability of having adjacent keys come up together so they wouldn't jam. 
This is the state of the art of how we interact with our EMRs. And then you combine that with our Mavis Beacon level typing skills. And it's little wonder physicians, I bet I did it, I don't know how many physicians in the room, but I've, if you're, I just asked you to do a one to five rating, one I hate, you know, an EMR epic, five I love it, I would not be surprised to see pretty uh, a, a consistent uh, reply to I hate the darn thing. I am tethered to it. I feel like it's robbing me of my ability to care for patients. I'm uh, reduced to being a clerk, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of a challenge. But what's cool is we're going to see fundamental changes to this in the next few years. I don't know how many of you have an Alexa at home, and I don't know how many of you would admit it if you had it. But I've got one. And it fundamentally changes how you think about how you interact with technology. I mean, I go home. Uh, see my wife, spend some time together. I go to bed relatively early because I get up early, but my pattern every night is the same. Alexa, you know, set an alarm for 4.30 a.m. Alexa, play NPR. Alexa, set a sleep timer for 30 minutes. And darn if she doesn't do it every darn time. <laughs> it's kind of amazing. Well, what the, is the clinical equivalent going to look like? And it's coming. I know of at least now four different companies who are well along the way of developing the clinical equivalent, which will be in our exam rooms, which will be in our OR suites, right? Where suddenly I can have a conversation with a patient, but I have an Alexa and a big screen. And I say, Alexa, show me the last year worth of hemoglobin A1Cs in a run chart. It's done. But even better, because we're all kind of pattern machines anyway, similar presentation, you go through similar steps, Alexa will learn your patterns. So she'll be anticipating. And oh, by the way, listening, so documentation is happening automatically in the background. My former organization uh, at PAMF, now all the primary care docs use Augmetics, you know, the Google Glass? And Augmetics is the company behind that. So there, they're still using human beings, right, the sneaker net on the back end, but they're documenting for the, for the physician, and they're supplying images up into that Google Glass so the physician can see it. Now, all of them said, wow, it felt really awkward at first, but I was just there about uh, two months ago. And to a person, they said, I, you can't take this away from me. You cannot, because it's fundamentally changed the dynamic in the exam room. We are going to see incredible advances in technology over the next three to five years. I was just, I had the opportunity to judge a national, or actually it was an international competition. Accenture sponsored it for startups. So I was just at the San Francisco, I uh, was concurrent with the JP Morgan conference. Um, so we saw the top 10 that came through the international competition. You know the one that won? There's some guys in New York who have created a cloth that has biosensors in it. It monitors seven different uh, functions. And what they've shown, their first test case with CHF, is they create a little sash for CHF patients to wear. They're able to predict a re or an admission for a CHF patient five months faster than anybody else has ever done. Now, that's kind of cool. But what's really cool, you start thinking about it, what does it look like when it, those are actually the sheets in our hospital? Or even more, what if it's your sheets at home? or your grandmother's sheets, or think about all of the applications, right? It's built in your clothes. It's, it's reusable, it's washable, it's amazing. Right? We're gonna see such a, everything, everything is gonna be connected to the internet. And it's all gonna be sensing and gonna be talking. Here's the challenge though. Operationally, we're gonna have to figure out what do we do with all that information? Because the, one of the biggest impediments is, you know, people are scared to death of having all this information flowing over them. At the same time, they're Mavis Beacon, the, you know, through their clinical day, and suddenly they have a whole nother data stream that they're supposed to be monitoring when they can't even get through their in-baskets today. And oh, by the way, who's liable? Who's, it, you know, taking the risk if something is a negative indication in that data stream? So it's going to be immensely challenging for us operationally to create and leverage those capabilities. Uh, in the future, but it's going to be incredibly exciting. It's going to fundamentally transform how we think of our interactions in technology. And then you got this little finding, right? This came from the Kaiser Family da Foundation in Brookings. Everybody's seen a variant of this at this point, right? As a care delivery system, and we're going to end up, as a care delivery system, we are going to be taking economic risk for care. 
It is inevitable, and I actually think it's a great thing because we're the one actor who can do something about it. Here's the only problem. We only affect about 10% of the total cost of care issues, right? Because the rest are tied up in socioeconomic factors, social environmental factors, genetics, and individual behaviors. So we're going to have to think much more broadly about what it means to manage people's health. That's what's so exciting about our relationships both with Health East as we, they came together with us. They've done some really interesting things in how they interact with the family. And also, you know, the potential at the University of Minnesota to really think about not just the medical school, but to think broadly across all the domain areas about how do we start affecting people's health in a more holistic way. Challenging. Now, what's also interesting to me, because we always, you know, beat ourselves about the head and shoulders of, geez, we spend a lot and we don't get very good outcomes. Well, okay, take that last slide and take this slide and put them together. So this study was done by the Kaiser Family Foundation in Brookings. Uh, this combines social spending with uh, medical spending. You notice where the U.S. is. Even though that turquoise bar is the highest, that's the medical spend, we're middle of the pack. We've just chosen to spend our money in different ways. We've chosen to medicalize our spend where other countries, OECD countries, have chosen to think about the social side and impacting many of those social determinants of care. And if you look at their clinical data, their clinical results, you could say that they're getting much better clinical results because of the decision they made. But it's not that we're not spending enough, you know, that we spend too much money on clinical care per se. It is we spend our money in very different ways in this country around health than other countries have chosen to spend. So interesting, challenging, and good gracious, there's a lot of partnerships going on. You see I'm, what I'm doing. I'm setting the stage for how uh, fun my job is every day. What a great challenge it is. Uh, you look at these, I, a year ago, I would have never, it would have never dawned on me to think CVS and Aetna. Now I get it because, you know, CVS has a specialty pharmacy uh, and, you know, the payers kept saying, no, we don't want your specialty pharmacy, so what do you do? Well, buy a big payer. You know, you got the money, why not? And I have a, fa a fantasy about being in the room when the Aetna side and the CVS side are having the conversation about, yeah, I'm trying to manage my costs, and the other side's going, those are my revenues. And by the way, we got to get ready for the quarterly analyst call, because uh, Wall Street will care a great deal about this, how that tension plays out. But the startling fact to me, and I, I've not verified this, I don't know if it's true, 80% of the US population is within 15 blocks of a CVS. So you think about the care platform that they potentially have, it's startling. Now, what they do with that, how they manage that, you know, if they just put in, you know, a, a, a bacterial exchange center is how I always think of them, those convenient, convenience clinics that can't do very much. <laughs> I guess it's an antibiotic exchange center, but it, I like that. You know, it's, uh, it, uh, maybe that's what they do, but if you think about, the, it's just a, an interesting partnership that creates a different sense, a sense, a set of potentials. Um, you also have players who are just do it, playing the old game at a much bigger scale, right? Uh, CHI and Dignity is just a play on size, right? That's all it is. And I don't know where they think they're going to get economies of scale that actually make this work. I still don't understand. And a good friend of mine, a former colleague, is a CFO at Dignity, Dan Morissette. Anytime I just saw him at JP Morgan, I keep asking him, okay, so if I take a negative one and add a negative one to it, how do I get a positive? Because that's what they're talking about. These two, neither organization is terribly strong. They've got huge debt loads. I don't know how you put them together and make them better. But it's one of the plays, right? They're playing the old game. I would say the same thing with Aurora and Advocate. They're playing a very similar game. Can you get bigger and can you leverage the payer market and get better rates and you know, manage the traditional game? UPMC, again, you know, it's a very fascinating, very large, have made some big bets that have really paid off as an academic, right? But they continue to, you know, they, their imperative is you've got to grow. Right? And they're a very solid top 10 academic, but their focus is we got to be big. That's the only way that we can compete as an academic. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. So 
big waves. I hope you know we're on that side of the surfboard with them, but uh, you know what do we do? Well, I think there's a third model, and that's really what we're starting to pursue at Fairview. If you think about the first model, it's like a pinball machine. That's the fee-for-service system. You throw people in, and they bounce around in various ways. The care is, you know, maybe good, but often isn't. It's often expensive. It's not, you know, efficient care because they're going to the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, maybe they know, uh, you know, get to the right physician and get terribly great care. But it's a, it's a stochastic process, right? It's not a deterministic one. You got to be a little bit lucky. And I'll bet you, most of you get phone calls from your friends and neighbors and say, oh my goodness, my mom just got a cancer diagnosis. My dad needs surgery. Who do I go see? What should I do? Who do I talk to? I mean, it, it, it happens in, even in my own family, right? It happens all the time. But that's the nature of our fee-for-service system. That's the predominant model. The other is the gatekeeper model, the managed care model, right? And whether it's a, a primary care physician as the gatekeeper or a health plan with prior auth rules and you know, uh, care management activities, whatever it is, the intent is the same in either way, is to manage and control the access to various resources for the consumer. Turns out, in the United States, people resent being told what they can and can't do. It's kind of weird, you know? So the gatekeeper model tends not to be responded to terribly well. Now, I think there's a third model. I think that's the bet that we have to make at Fairview. And that third model is much more of the consumer-centric model, but truly being consumer-centric. And the bet ultimately comes down to, if you look at the Dartmouth data from the 1990s, you know, when people are presented with good information, they tend to make very good and usually pretty conservative healthcare choices. So the bet is, look, if we think of ourselves as really helping patients meet their want and need, wants and needs and match them to the incredible resources that we have, whether it's on the you know, primary care end of the spectrum or home health end of the spectrum or all the way to you know, tertiary quaternary care uh, through the university. But if we think about our job is primarily in matching and anticipating wants and needs and getting people and helping them navigate to the right place and then trusting that once there, if we're good at execution, the care will be more efficient and will be a more attractive value proposition, therefore dri dri driving more value right, to consumers and be successful in the market. I believe there's a third model out there. I don't know what it looks like. No one's really ever created. I can't go site visit. I can't copy and paste here. There are snippets in various ways. But I think that's the pursuit. And somebody's going to figure it out. Somebody's going to leverage the technology. Somebody's going to leverage the information. Somebody's going to leverage the capabilities and be able to present that kind of model. And I think it'd be huge. So I think if consumers had that, they would flock to it. Where they didn't feel like they were a pinball and don't feel like they're locked in and being told what's good for them, what they can access, what they can't access. Now, we believe there's some key platform capabilities that we have to develop. Data analytics is a huge one, right? So I, uh, I was told you about, I was judging this uh, group. There's a, uh, I, I know just of the enough of the mathematics to a, kind of assume it's true, but couldn't prove it. Um, so uh, a group of guys have used a different optimization scheme or a predictive uh, modeling scheme uh, around eigenspaces. And again, I remember enough of my uh, graduate mathematics to be dangerous, so I can't really prove it. But if you believe the data they're showing, it's remarkable the level of predictive analytics that they're able to produce. An anticipation of readmissions, an anticipation of admissions, anticipation of negative health events. Because the problem we have is it's like driving down I-94 in the rearview mirror, right? It's not a very effective strategy when you're driving a car forward. That's why the front windshield is so much bigger than the rear view mirror. You're supposed to look out the front windshield. But what I get from analytics is all what happened 30, 60, 90 days ago. Doesn't do me a lot of good to tell me I hit something 90 days ago. 
Maybe I can sleuth around and have some analysis to get to root cause, and maybe I can pull that forward, but much better is to be able to be anticipatory, to be predictive, to anticipate events. And that's really the kind of analytic platform that we've got to build. And so the advances of the guys I saw, uh, Tavantos was the, I think I got that right, J-V-A-N-T-O-S was the company. But things like that are going to be part of the answer of how do we start to be much more anticipatory, much more like uh, many of our technology companies. You know, you think about what Amazon knows about you or what Google knows about you and is able to predict what your behaviors are. It is uh, both alarming and amazing. But wouldn't it be cool if we could use that as a force for good and health as opposed to, can I get more of your share of your wallet? Second thing is around consumer technology. <clears throat> as I talked about earlier, uh, you know, this is everybody expects it. Everybody uh, you know, of, of a certain generation does most of what they want to do through a mobile uh, technology. And frankly, uh, healthcare is way, way behind. The state of the art for us in large part is my chart. All right? And I, I did a panel uh, for the Puget Sound, or Puget Sound, wrong city, uh, Minnesota uh, Business Journal this morning. And I may get in trouble for this. I don't know. Judy Faulkner may come and find me. Um, but I made the comment that I think this, one of the single biggest impediments to innovation in healthcare is epic. Because what they've done is create a closed system. They believe that the only good ideas have to come from Verona, Wisconsin. And on the off chance that us, you know, simple folk out here outside of Verona get a good idea, it's still owned by Verona. Well, it's amazing when you think about that compared to, you know, I just saw, I bet, a billion dollars chasing good ideas in San Francisco at J.P. Morgan. But none of those are good ideas can really leverage Epic because Epic is essentially a closed system. Now, they reluctantly start to make some of their APIs visible. But boy, is it reluctant. But what would it look like if Epic said, OK, we're going to create an open platform for not Epic. I don't care so much about that, right? But for apps sitting on top of it. And good ideas can prosper. And uh, entrepreneurs can make money on those good ideas. We don't care, because Judy's got her private jet and billions of dollars. She's got more money than she can ever spend. It's not about the money. It's more about being creating the kind of environment that where we can have truly innovation happen. So you know, that's my hope. I threatened to, I offered to uh, organize a march on uh, Madison, Wisconsin this morning. Uh, I, I think I had a couple of takers. Uh, but we'll see. If, uh, if somebody finds me dead in my home tonight, you know, uh, Judy reached out. Um, I'm a huge believer in primary care. Right? I don't believe in primary care as the gatekeeper because I think that model puts our primary care physicians in an untenable position and uh, is one of the many reasons why so many primary care physicians are burnt out and leaving the profession. Right? I just don't believe in that model, but I believe in good, capable primary care. It is the one factor. If you look at the literature and trying to predict effective total cost of care management, it is the one factor that reliably demonstrates that it does just that. And it's been shown across multiple countries. So one of the things that we have to build is a, a significant primary care capability, and it has to cover the spectrum. Because while I might make fun of antibiotic exchange centers, people like the access. They like the convenience. Medical homes and the ability to really systematically manage populations are critical. And the data around the ambulatory ICU, you know, the patients who have multiple comorbidities have significant psychosocial issues where you're carrying a panel of maybe 400 instead of 2,000, but you're intensely managing those patients have also been shown to be incredibly effective. Now, I don't know you know, where we'll end up and what the mix is going to be, but we have to be very crisp and very good about how we think about our primary care because it'll be critical to our ability to manage total cost of care. Not in a gatekeeper model, but as a relationship and a guide and a support for patients. And then the last one, if you Google me, the one thing you'll probably see, um, uh, ignore the arrest uh, uh, reports, they're not true is what I'm pretty well known for is the application of lean in healthcare. 
Uh, I've been doing that a long time. I came out of the total quality world, worked at the IHI with Berwick and Batalden and Plesik and all those folks. I had a great opportunity to learn a lot about quality. And what I learned was this stuff really works, except leadership keeps screwing it up. <laughs> and so the reason I believe in lean in part is because what Toyota basically did was stole all the improvement stuff. There's nothing new, you know. If you want to see one piece flow, you know, Read Today and Tomorrow by Henry Ford. They were doing one piece flow in the River Rouge plant you know, in the teens. Raw iron ore in the sixth floor, Model T is rolling out the first floor and a continuous batch process or continuous flow process. So none of that's new, but what the Japanese did, what Toyota did, was codify a management system that supported continuous improvement at scale. And that's what I believe in. Because I think one of the biggest wastes we have in healthcare is, like we got 32,000 people working at Fairview. That is an immense resource. And in large part, it's going to waste. I don't have, here's the environment I aspire to. I want 32,000 people walking in every day, making us just a little bit better. And challenging the status quo, challenging the standard work. Standard work is still important, but the thing that people often don't understand, standard work is the baseline into an experiment. It's not an endpoint. It's just a, an agreement, well, this is the best way we know how. Let's do it that way until we figure out a better way. And then let's systematically challenge ourselves to get better. The, the hard part is managing in that environment looks very different than the classic management, tell and sell, you know, control, tell people what to do, management style, which is predominant in many of our organizations. Right? So we have to think differently about that. So uh, part of one of our fundamental uh, capabilities that we're talking about is this Fairview operating system, two pillars. Evidently, when you do lean, you have to have a house, so we copied another house from Toyota. But you know, our two pillars, improvement and management, based on our people, principles, mission, uh, you know, having a deployment system. So uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because uh, I want to stop uh, talking and let you ask a question. But we're really trying to build a continuous improvement culture that is supported by leadership from me on down. Right, that supports our people coming in and saying, I got a better idea, I got a better way, I got an experiment I want to try. Because if we can unleash those 32,000 people, immense things can happen. All right, I'm skipping through this. I'm not going to do the lean lecture because um, I want to give you guys some time if you had questions. Always a nice quote. So let me stop there. Hopefully you got some sense of both the environment and the challenges that as I see them from where I sit and how we're thinking about the response to them. You know, those platform capabilities have to get translated into specific markets and we've got some ideas about what those are. You don't have to be a, a rocket surgeon to figure out that more people are gonna turn 65 in the next decade than ever before. Uh, and oh, by the way, Medicare fee for service is a great way to lose a lot of money um, no matter what your volumes are. So, you know, we'll be in the Medicare Advantage market. We have to serve the Medicare population well. I mean, you, you can imagine what our markets are that we're going to have to be effective in. But those platform capabilities are critical for us to be successful in any of those. So with that, let me stop. Happy to entertain questions for a few minutes. Very kind, thank you. I learned about Minnesota Nice over the first like three months. I keep going to the leadership meetings and thought, you know, everybody's smiling at me and nodding my, their head, and I thought they agreed with me. <laughs> Turns out that doesn't mean anything. I've figured that out now. So I thank you for your applause. I don't know how you really feel about me at this point, but I appreciate the, uh, please. Um, three things come to mind. So what's, what's the biggest uh, surprise? Since I've been here, you know, from the West Coast, what were the, the biggest surprise that, uh, you know, I've experienced? Is that a fair? Um, one is 15 below is really cold. I forgot how cold it is. Uh, two is, um, you know, I've been in this market, uh, observing this market in the mid-90s because, I mean, this was the place, right? If you want to see, you know, people really thinking as a community, you know, what's the cutting edge? It was all happening here. 
You know, I, 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 we probably have lost a little bit of our edge, but what I'm fascinated by is the collaboration, right? I have never, it, this would never happen in California. Me sitting with a bunch of CEOs who I compete with and payer CEOs who I, you know, I'm not necessarily friends with on a day-to-day -day basis, collaborating about things like, well, how do we manage this? How do we think about this opioid crisis? That is so unique, to, in my mind, to Minnesota, right? It, that would never happen in California in a million years. The third surprise, frankly, is the complexity of our relationship with the University of Minnesota, right? I, I was at Stanford. I mean, I understand academic medicine. I get, you know, the complexities of academic medicine. And I understand, having been a, a, one of the key leaders for driving the, the uh, Stanford medicine strategy, just generally how complex academic medicine is in every instance across the country. I really wasn't quite fully prepared for the complexity of this 20-year history that we've developed between the two organizations. Now, I think the great news is we've got so many new leaders who don't share in that past, don't have any of that history, and frankly, we don't have the time to perseverate on it because there's too much work to do going forward. So I have a lot of uh, optimism about that, but frankly, that was one of my surprises is just how deep some of those feelings ran. Before we continue, um, we are recording this, so before you ask your question, I'm going to run this mic over to you, and if you could all help pass it over, that'd be great. Good to have standard work. Excellent. Here we go. <laughs> Who's next? Now you're going to get your uh, steps get in. Get my steps in. Thanks a lot. I'm John Finnegan, Dean of the School of Public Hi, John. Health. Um, uh, you uh, talked a little bit about uh, the... Um, uh, potential uh, assets that a connection with uh, a research one university brings. Could you talk a little bit more on that in terms of how you see that relating to that question mark third model? Well, so I think it represents a very unique set of assets that people desire, right? There, there is a category of care where you want absolutely uh, the best person or the complexity is such that you only find it in a, you know, a tertiary quaternary, usually academic setting, right? It, I'm not going to Hibbing. I love Hibbing. We have a hospital there. I'm not going there for my VAD, right? I'm going to go to the University of Minnesota. And I want to go to the person who's done the most VADs and who has the best outcomes. And you know, I think, in part, that's what it represents. But it also represents a couple of other things. One is the projection of capabilities across our system, right? Because uh, I'll speak from personal experience. My father-in-law has uh, uh, stage four prostate cancer, right? So he, we have him in a clinical trial at uh, the University of Minnesota. That's a godsend, right, to my my father. Now, he still needs to have organized care that happens throughout the system. You know, got to get him into an infusion clinic on Sunday. I mean, it, it's part of the care system. It's not just the clinical trial if it's done well. But the ability to project that clinical trial capability, both as a, uh, a value add to patients, but also the ability to advance science about what works, what doesn't, what's efficacious is critical. And I think if you look at most academic settings, what they are concerned about is, can I have a big enough platform so I both can be, you know, the, uh, the principal investigator because I can bring the lives to the, uh, to the experiment, but also can I get enough reps so I can have fellows, can I have residents, so I can really be a premier academic environment from a teaching perspective. So the synergy between those two uh, is really significant. Third reason, there's a bunch of stuff going on in labs over at the University of Minnesota that are going to represent, I mean, we have an amazing uh, genomics capability, computational genomics. It's the, the depth of capabilities represent some of the best things that are going to happen in the next five to 10 years. So it's like an R&D lab. Now, if we can get our relationship squared away, Right? That is an R&D capability that if you're just in a community hospital, you don't have. Right? I don't care how big your system is. So that R&D that that represents is, in my mind, worth the investment from the care delivery system to say, we get it. We need, I know we need to fund it. I understand academic medicine because we believe there's a return, not necessarily a short-term return on that spot, but that's the long-term investment and return we get uh, for that R&D. I was hoping somebody else on that end of the room would ask just to watch him run back and forth. It'd be like a tennis match. How are you? So 
that raises an interesting question if you're thinking about research versus clinical care, and I know Mayo struggles with this same thing. Who? Mayo. <laughs> the, the guys, the guys. I'm, I'm not familiar with them. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, the research going on is dynamic and really exciting, but grant-driven. Yep. And they're separate from the clinical care going on. And so it's a problem to try to catch the patient at the right area to get them into a clinical trial when they're at the step of care where you can truly measure baseline yep. to improvement. How are you approaching that at Fairview at the University of Minnesota? Well, I think it's an act of becoming. It's a great question, and I absolutely agree. I think it's an act of becoming. How do we strengthen our ability to make sure that we're offering and enrolling you know, at the right place to be able to get far enough upstream? Um, I'd also comment that it is grant-driven, um, but the, the nature of uh, you know, what the uh, NIH is going to fund uh, disproportionately goes to the top 10 universities. All right. Stanford is number one in terms of uh, grant dollars per faculty. That is not going to change. Or it'll take a monumental uh, event, Hopkins, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the challenge for us, if we really want to be able to move Minnesota from where we're at to where we really should be in the top 20, top 10, is going to be we're going to have to look at alternative modes of funding as well. And part of that has to come from the care delivery system. Part of that has to be in partnerships with device makers and others. But we're going to have to get creative about how we think about that. Because if what we're depending on is we're going to follow the path that got the, you know, the top 10 to the top 10, the environment is just not as permissive as it used to be 10, 20, 30 years ago in terms of being able to get grant funding, especially for junior faculty. It just is so much more difficult now than it was you know, then. Did that? Adequate answer? Well, do you have any information? No, well, we have a, oh, we have great plans. <laughs> I, I, I have found that out about us. We have a lot of great plans. Now, are we executing to those plans and are we specific and capable? No, not yet. But, I mean, it's not, again, it's not rocket surgery. You know, a lot of research universities have solved that. So it, that one is much more of a copy and paste uh, problem. But we get, you got to do the work. Right? You've got to roll up your sleeves and actually do the work. And I, the research hub is a nice start to that, but only a start, and we've got to build off of that. With your self-declared expertise in... Uh-oh. Uh <laughs> this sounds I like would, a setup. I'm going to start moving. To, <laughs> no, no. I would like to know how you know how much to stop fixing the standardization in your process because you have to have diversity or you're screwed. Where do you stop? So um, what my uh, uh, good friend uh, always talks about in terms of um, positive deviations, yeah, well, right? Lay it on, stochastically or any other way. God, I <laughs> This has, got to be, this has got to be the professor who everybody goes, oh, God, I've got his class. <laughs> well, so <laughs> two things. My, my son got a PhD at Stanford. I've been sorry for him ever since. <laughs> 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 There's just so many, so many ways to go wrong right now. So two thoughts. One is, that's why it's not just about standardization, right? Part of the deviations come from experimentation, of trying ideas and engaging people. Because if, if it were just about standardization, you've become a, a complete. You purposefully screw things up. You purposefully uh, run experiments to see if you screw them up or make them better. The second is, uh, I think Toyota's instructive in this way. I'm not a big Toyota guy. I, you know, I've been to their plants, and it's amazing. But you can see a lot of examples are just as good. What's interesting, though, is their plants don't all look the same, right? There is variation, even at a place that's been doing this for, for a long time. But what they're incredibly good at is Yokotan. Yokotan is learning across, right? So what we've got to create is an environment and a culture where we are stealing the best and leaving the rest. If you've got a better idea, which I bet you have a lot of them, and I can steal and use that idea, I should have, it should be an environment that rewards, not, not penalizes it, and in fact rewards you for sharing it, as opposed to rewarding you for hoarding it. 
So those two ideas, I'm sure they're inferior, um, and I look forward to taking your class. <laughs> Oh yeah, so there's a whole story there. So you know, there are two pronunciations, right? Um, there's the Western pronunciation, Hereford, right? And there's the English pronunciation, Hereford. My dad was a rancher. So he didn't want to have Hereford's Hereford's. So he chose the English pronunciation, Hereford, so he could distinguish him from the cows. <laughs> I got time for one more question. Oh. Hi. <laughs> Anybody um. but him. <laughs> so I don't know how I'm going to follow that <laughs> exchange. Um, Please don't feel compelled to do so. <laughs> so um, I, I actually work for the School of Public Health and the MHA program, but prior to coming here, I worked in Connected Health at Partners Healthcare, so mm -hmm. Mass General and Brigham. Um, and one of the things that they did was uh, create a whole infrastructure around Connected Health as it pertains to population health management and sort of strategic uh, visions for the institution and rolled clinical programs out as a result to kind of test feasibility and efficacy, but then actually hope that would roll into mm -hmm. uh, sustained improvements. And I'm really, I love consumer activation and healthcare consumer engagement, and I find it very promising that this is a kind of tenant of where you see the future going. How do you think, though, it's hard to disrupt, you know, how things have been, you know, as we've delivered healthcare and as we've trained physicians. How can we kind of create this as a new norm within health systems and trying not to have physician burnout, you know, being inundated with new processes and introducing new technologies and new ways of engaging the patients, how can we do this in a way that is feasible and sustainable? You know, it's a big disruptive time, so how can we do this? Well, thank you guys, I really appreciate being here. <laughs> um, well, it's a, a tremendous question and maybe the most important question we have that you, we need to seek answers for. But here's my rather simplistic answer to your very uh, sophisticated and complex question. I'm a big fan of Everett Rogers' uh, Diffusion of Innovation. He wrote the book in like 1960, right? And it wasn't about technology, it was about agricultural improvements. But what he basically described was population health for leaders, right? And you'll recognize, if you don't know the book, you'll recognize the nomenclature, right? So you've got innovators, you've got early adopters, you've got early majority, late majority, and laggards. And to me, that's incredibly instructive about how you do broad scale change. To me, it's population health for leaders because we don't deal with the innovators because they're off trying to make a gazillion dollars. They don't work in organizations. But we deal with early adopters. The key is don't get fooled by your early adopters because they just love change. It doesn't matter what it is. It's the early majority that's key. So if we're presenting a new proposition to anybody, whether it's physicians or nurses or consumers, early adopters change on reward. What's the whiff them? What's in it for me, right? They're critical and you have to find them and you have to find them at a big enough scale that they'll adopt. But the great news is if you can do that, they pull, and especially with physicians because they're a little bit hyper competitive, they'll pull the late majority who change on risk of not changing, right? If the risks are too great that I, you know, I can't stay here or in a physician's case, Wow, you're getting home at 30 minutes after the last visit and your in-basket's clean? That's cool. I want that, right? That late majority will come. And then the laggards are the people who aren't changing. I don't care how many resources you throw at them. They are satisfied with the status quo. And the trick is to be able to identify them and then not spend all your resources trying to change them. It's not a good answer to your very wise, very specific question, but I think how we think about change processes, we as leaders have to be more thoughtful and more sophisticated and more strategic about how we think about adoption. Equally sophisticated to many of our retail colleagues who are very sophisticated when they think about adoption of new product entrants, new things, right? They're very smart about how they do it. And combine that with uh, you know, uh, behavioral economics, and I think you have a really interesting set of strategies you can start to employ. All right, thank you. <laughs>